rigorous refutation of this claim of the point. No one can purposefully not act. Now consider, however, some economic proposition. What is consumed now cannot be consumed again later. Without private property and production factors, there can be no prices, and without prices, cost accounting is impossible. If we increase the amount of money without increasing the quantity of non-money goods, social wealth will not be higher, but only the prices of the market. What is consumed now cannot be consumed again later. It's Jose Galison. You're watching No Way Jose. You can find me on No Way Jose YouTube channel on all the major auto podcasters and Odyssey as well. My guest today is Toad. So you guys know what the fuck that means. We're continuing our live reading series of Democracy, the God that Failed, uh, probably Hoppa's most notable banger. Uh, yeah, I do want to let you guys know how this works. Uh, if you aren't aware, I mean, you're fucking... I think 11, 12, or 12. This is 12, part 12. We're 12 deep. So if you don't, if you don't, if you don't know the deal by now, I don't know what the fuck to tell you. But uh, these are paywalled. Uh, so pretty much the way this works is right now, this is the 31st. And so if you're a patron, you could catch this live stream. If not, you're going to have to wait roughly a week or so later. I'm not entirely sure when I'm dropping this one, um, you know, if you're concerned, because I am going on Timcast on February 8th. So that might mess with the schedule. We'll see what goes on there. But yeah, so if you want to be able to, you know, watch these live streams with patrons, uh, it's patreon.com. It's no way Jose 2020. Uh, pretty much all my content goes like a, except for four pony boys. And maybe on rare occasions, I may do, may switch things up a little bit and, uh, you know, what, say if it's like a current event thing or I don't know, but for the most part, the vast majority of my content, this will be the deal. So like I said, patreon.com is no way Jose 2020 lowest level is two bucks. that get you access to those live streams. The highest level is 20 and that's a sponsor level. And so I read you guys off every episode 
I have Mikel Thorpe of the Expat Money Show. I have Jeremy who has an Etsy store at Etsy.com slash shop slash Raising Liberty. And also my guest Toad. He's one of them as well. He's my uh, he's my co-host on Tower Gang. Uh, you know, you can follow him at uh, Tower Gang Toad. I also have Zach Overacker at Z-O-V-E-R-A-C-K on Twitter if you want to follow him there. Zoverack. Uh, yeah. Uh, also... Uh, toplobster.com uh, definitely go there if you want to get any of my merch I just have new merch that dropped the shirt that I'm going to be wearing at Timcast says Taron Siki didn't kill himself uh, it's it's a good one if you want to get that or you can get just the, the, the normal No Way Jose one I uh, highly suggest the, uh, that, uh, that Taron Siki one that's what I'm going to be wearing there uh, it's a fucking it's an awesome shirt kind of playing off the whole uh, Epstein motif but he's not an Epstein that motherfucker's a hero he was the one good cop uh, and with that, let's go ahead and get, oh yeah, use Jose at checkout for 10% off and let's get a uh, toad in here. Yeah. What's up, well, what's up? You mean if somebody, you mean nobody, uh, shoots, stabs, beats and strangles themselves all at once. That doesn't happen. Yeah. I think it's funny before we started, we were saying how you're, uh, Oh, never mind. It's clearing up again. Your, uh, your shit got blurry for a second. We were talking shit before Whoa. we started that, uh, uh, about how you always seem to have these mic or camera problems lately. And, uh, <laughs> Your camera was perfect. Your mic was working perfect. And then we started right. and it got, now it got a little bit blurry. It seemed to come back. I don't know. If, maybe it's a little bit blurry now. I don't know. I think it's better now. We're good. I just thought it was funny. You were talking Ooh, shit. I can't it tell. It looks good to me, but who knows yeah. what it looks like over the internet. I, I, yeah. I killed the one drain, uh, my, yeah. you know, massive file downloading. So I'm not going to incriminate thing, myself. The funny thing is though, with these like podcast things, it's always, if you're in the stream, it's always hard to tell whose fault it is. Cause for me, like say my signal goes to shit it will look like you're blurry, but then like it'll be the vice versa for you, and really it'll be me being blurry like on the right. stream. So it's just it is weird. These are little yeah. isms you don't know unless you actually do podcast or whatever. But it is annoying because you always yeah. like you'll be convinced it's the other person's fault, and you're like, no, nah, it's you. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm just Bigfoot, man. I'm blurry. Yeah. Well, all right, man. We're on to the immigration chapter today, I believe. Uh, yeah, the first of, I think, two immigration yeah. chapters. This one is immigration and forced integration. And I think this yeah. is the one that uh, the Hoppe detractors uh, tend to get more pissed about, probably. Yeah, and he makes a good case. I'll say, like, I've, I mean, everyone is concerned and wants to know my position. I, I, I'm like kind of neither for or against. I know that's kind of a fence sitter position, but like, I pretty much agree with everything he says, but I don't necessarily advocate for the government to do anything. I, I don't know. I guess I'm just more ambivalent to it. I see arguments on both sides, but I kind of definitely lean more towards Hoppe, if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so far as like the government doing something about it, I, I don't know. I mean, there is no true uh, libertarian like way to solve it through the state. I mean, Correct. both both positions are unlibertarian in a certain sense. Uh, yeah. So unless you're going to completely abolish the government and we go to a private property system, right. uh, but yeah, then and that's that's neither uh, open or closed borders. That's just you know you get to choose for yourself or your individual property. So, right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I just tend to think that yeah, the open border uh, advocates who are in the libertarian camp tend to kind of uh, just reject the idea that that that, that idea is also not libertarian or they at least reject the idea that uh there can be certain forms of uh border control that are that are less anti-libertarian than just purely open borders yeah i mean for me like immigration and probably abortion are probably the two issues that i'm kind of like i'm like i don't really hate on anyone too much for either side depending on how you go about it i can understand yeah. libertarian arguments for either i'm pro-life uh, in a certain sense, although I don't necessarily advocate for the government to do anything about it, uh, but I do think it's fucking murder. So I'm also not upset right. if they do. <laughs> yeah, the ab abortion, I'm yeah pretty strict on. Right, I think yeah. that the only libertarian position is pro life, uh, whereas you know the border thing, we know that open borders and closed borders are both unlibertarian yeah. solutions because the government is in control of the border either way. So or they're deciding who comes in and who doesn't. So but my only point is like, these are probably the two issues that like I give people more leeway on depending on yeah. how you go about it. Like every other issue. I'm like, nah, that's just pretty settled. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but all right, let's go ahead and get into it. Enough chair chatter. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's hear what Hoppe has to say. Yeah. We're on chapter seven on free immigration and forced integration. 
The classical argument in favor of free immigration runs as follows. Other things being equal, businesses go to low-wage areas and labor moves to high-wage areas, thus affecting a tendency toward the equalization of wage rates for the same kind of labor, as well as the optimal localization of capital. An influx of migrants into a given size high-wage area will lower nominal wage rates. However, it will not lower real wage rates re, uh, real wage rates if the population is below its optimum size. To the contrary, if this is the case, the produced output will increase overproportionately and real incomes will actually rise. Thus, restrictions on immigration will harm the productive or the protected domestic workers qua consumers more than they gain qua uh, producers. Moreover, immigration restrictions will increase the flight of capital abroad, the export of capital, which otherwise might have stayed, still causing an equalization of wage rates, although somewhat more slowly, but leading to a less than optimal allocation of capital, capital thereby harming world living standards all around. All right, I don't know if you have any uh, comments on this. I will say uh, it does make it sound like at the beginning of this chapter, he's all for open uh, immigration or for free open borders, but he, 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 he may, there's a, there's a key change at some point later where he goes, but <laughs> well, well, no. So, yeah. uh, in this first paragraph, he yeah. is just describing what yeah. like the open border uh, position is yes. and talking about how, uh, they make the point that, um, if you have some sort of border uh, restrictions, then you're sort of, uh, you're making it no longer a free market and you can't have uh, the completely free flow of uh, labor and capital. And uh, it will, um, you know, cause uh, non-optimal uh, allocations of it. Like for instance, you might have like some, I guess, country that is like a producer of something that is, uh, you know, that has that uh, comparative advantage or whatever in producing that thing. And, you know, you might uh, be, like preventing them from actually doing that uh, to the degree that they would be or whatever. If like certain countries are saying, well, we're not going to import this stuff from them or whatever. Like, I think that's kind of what he's getting at there. Yeah. In addition, traditionally labor unions and nowadays environmentalists are opposed to free immigration. And this should prima facie count as another argument in favor of policy of free immigration. Uh, I do like that. It's funny. It's just like labor unions and environmentalists, because they're against it uh fuck them <laughs> that's really yeah. all that means <laughs> i think that's more him being a little silly but uh yeah um he's almost mm -hmm. more making the point like if these guys are in favor of something you can almost kind of just take the knee jerk ops it's kind of his point you say yeah obviously that's not what he thinks but he's kind of i think he's making a little bit light there is my opinion. yeah it's kind of <laughs> yeah it's hilarious because you'll get like uh like people like bernie sanders yeah. uh you know who are way on the left who will not advocate for open borders and uh, have arguments like along similar lines to that. Yeah. All right. Uh, part two, as it is stated, the above argument in favor of free immigration is irrefutable. It would be foolish to attack it. This is what I was getting at earlier. He said, that's why he start, starts with the key, key phrase there is as it is stated, it, right. you know, like kind of like, yeah, sure. If this is the only things we're taking into account. It would be foolish mm. to attack it, just as it would be foolish to deny that free trade leads to higher living standards than does protectionism. Yeah. It would also be wrong to attack the above case for free immigration by pointing out that because of the existence of a welfare state, immigration has become to a significant extent the immigration of welfare bums who do not increase but rather decrease average living standards, even if the United States, for instance, is below her optimal population point. For this is not an argument against immigration, but against the welfare state. To be sure, the welfare state should be destroyed its entirety. However, the problems of immigration and welfare are analytically distinct problems and must be treated accordingly. Mm -hmm. Which this kind of goes to the point where this is pretty common, like a conservatarian position where it's like, well, you know, if we got we're the, we're the welfare state, you know, there is a point to that. You know, like it's kind of like the part of the welfare state was what causes the problem. But he's kind of making the point that like, OK, but like that's not really a good argument against open borders because it's like, right. well, I mean, you're just pointing out another ill of the state and being like, well, then we need to do this. If we're taking the, the position that open borders is a proper position, then you can't use an other ill of the state to prop it up. Like, you know, as an argument against it. Cause it's like, okay, but that's also not a good thing that they shouldn't, that's also a thing they shouldn't be doing. So the, yeah. you can't use that to support that, you know? Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with him and you know that 
like I, I think the two issues are are linked, but you know, of course, uh, I think it is correct to say that uh, a policy of open borders would be much less detrimental if the welfare state didn't exist. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think he's probably going to go on to say, I haven't read this in a while, but, uh, something that I would agree with that, uh, the stuff that he just laid out, uh, prior to this, the argument that is for open borders is actually an argument for an entirely free market and free trade, uh, you know, across the board. And I believe he's going to say that open borders is not the same thing as that. Yeah, he, it, it, this is what I was getting at earlier. Once again, where he was, it kind of is like makes it sound like he is making an open borders argument at the beginning, yeah. and then he gets to a point where he gets a little bit more nuanced with his arguments, because he is kind of almost, you know, taking the he's making the point here that once again that you know if we are to take that argument that open border advocates make, and you know just simply that, which there will be you know more of the ads in later, then yeah, sure, that's right. And you can't use the welfare argument against it because that would be kind of silly argumentation in a certain sense because you're just pointing out something else they did bad. And but he's going to give a better argument later when we'll get to it. Right. Um, the problem with the above argument is uh, is that it suffers from two interrelated shortcomings which invalidate its unconditional pro-immigration conclusion and slash or which render the argument applicable only to a highly unrealistic long bygone situation in human history. The first shortcoming will only be touched upon. To libertarians of the Austrian school, it should be clear that what constitutes wealth and well-being is subjective. Material wealth is not the only thing that has value. Thus, even if real incomes rise due to immigration, it does not follow that immigration must be considered good. For one, might uh, prefer lower living standards and a greater distance to other people over higher living standards and a smaller distance to others. It's actually funny. We were kind of having this sort of having this argument somewhat. I mean, not exactly this argument, but sort yeah. of in the in the GC. Not even really argument. We we're actually kind of all agreeing with each other. It's right. kind of the argument about rural versus city because usually you're yeah. going to typically have more. Typically, you're going to have more business opportunities in a more highly populated area. But right, you know, I. I live in a more rural area. I know you live in a more uh, urban area. Yeah. But uh, I definitely prefer my living situation as opposed to a urban area. And I think you would actually kind of agree with me. Yeah. yeah I, I find more yeah. subjective <laughs> uh, value uh, living this way as opposed to living in a more densely populated area, which may give me, you know, more monetary benefit because, you know, I have less, uh, less, yeah. less, uh, what's the word? Like, I don't have to commute as much. I don't have to do this or that. Like it, it makes life a lot easier in a certain way, at least economically speaking, but I'd be probably living in a little itty bitty apartment or something with my whole family, which would yeah. be awful to me. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was an argument that uh, top lobster was getting into that kind of started with uh, like something about the housing supply. But yeah, as we know, he moved out of New York city and into mm -hmm. uh far less densely populated area in Florida. And, uh, he is arguing, you know, for that style of living because he values that way more. And I think he's correct, even though that might mean that your uh, wage rate is going to be lower than it would in the city. But then also, of course, his uh, cost of living is also going to be lower than it would be in the city as well. So, yeah. So, it's, I mean, it's not necessarily apparent that obviously this is just if you make the case that. Would you rather live in a place with higher density of people, but you make more money or vice versa, mm -hmm. less people, but you make uh, you make less money? Like, um, I, I think me and Top Lobs and probably I know a lot of people would prefer to make less money and live further away from people and have more space and, you know, more land, more more square footage, wh what have you. Yeah, because because of subjective value. That's why not everything right. is as simple as money. Uh, you know, money is not the only thing that comes into play, even in an economic sense, you know, because it's kind of where we've talked about before that, like, uh, you know, economics is in a certain sense kind of everything, you know. Right. So, yeah. Instead, a second related shortcoming will be the focus here. With regard to a given territory into which people immigrate, it is left unanalyzed who, if anyone owns, controls this territory. In fact, in order to render the above argument applicable, it is impl implicitly assume that the territory in question is unowned and that the immigrants enter virgin territory 
Obviously, today, this can no longer be assumed. If this assumption is dropped, however, the problem of imminent immigration takes on an entirely new meaning and requires fundamental rethinking. And this mm-hmm. is the but that I alluded to earlier. Yeah. He's saying, yes, this your the open uh, open border argument makes sense if we make the assumption that all these places are going are unowned territory, which in a pri- in a in a free market system, in a true private property mm-hmm. society, there right. probably would be little to no unowned areas. So in the unowned areas that there would be, yeah, sure. These people can pass freely through them because nobody owns them. If they want to, they can, I don't know, dig a hole and say they mix their labor with the land and it's their property now. <laughs> right. Right. Cause that, yeah, then like everything would be homesteadable and whatever. However, yeah. In the situation that we have now, this is kind of similar to what he was talking about in the previous chapter with the de-socialization of everything. And like, how do you determine uh, like who the rightful owners might wind up being of these things? Like this kind of plays into that. Well, who like would be like the people that have the most claim to that property and, it is not an equal claim to everybody across the board, especially like if you have somebody that has not been paying like into this system via taxation or whatever else. And now they just come in. Like, I don't think you can say that they haven't as equal a claim to this as somebody who has been paying into it uh, for their entire life. Exactly. All right. Part three, for the purpose of illustration, let us first assume an anarcho capitalist society, though convinced that such a society is the only social order that can be defended as just, I do not want to explain here why this is the case. Instead, I will employ it as a conceptual benchmark because this will help explain the fundamental misconception of most contemporary free immigration advocates. All land is privately owned, including all streets, rivers, airports, harbors, and so on. With with respect to some pieces of land, the property title may be unrestricted. That is, the owner is permitted to do with his property Whatever he pleases, as long as he does not physically damage the property owned by others. With respect to other territories, the property title may be more or less severely restricted. As is currently the case in some housing developments, the owner may be bound by contractual limitations onto what he can do with his property. Voluntary zoning, which this is exactly the argument we had top lobster. This is exactly the argument we had top lobster because he got into an argument because he said, you know where he lived they had a uh, you know everyone had to have a certain amount of acreage and people like oh that's government zoning it's like okay but yeah in a free society this would be a thing the argument is more that the government doesn't do it you know properly or efficiently to the best way possible this is kind of the same argument right. as like being against fire departments it's like okay but in a free society we'd have fire departments the only difference is under this current system they're probably i don't know probably wasting a lot of money and not being as efficient as they could be or, you know, operating the way they, they should. Right. And right. in the free environment, like there would have to be competition amongst yeah. uh, the people that are setting the rules about that property. So they would have to probably set uh, rules that, um, well, as I just said, that can compete. So like better rules, essentially, like rules that are going to actually draw more people to want to actually live there. Yeah. But so under the current paradigm, there's nothing wrong with saying, oh, here's this area that the state has designated to have this this amount of acres per whatever and this is how i'd prefer to live my life so i'm going to live there obviously it's you know preferable that the state didn't exist and this was being done in a voluntary sense but you know you're moving there and you're making that decision on for on an individual level anyways which yeah. might include residential versus commercial use no buildings more than four stories high no sale or rent to jews G- germans catholics homosexuals haitians families with or without children or smokers for example oh, and now wow. this is where we start getting into especially in this chapter and later on where people get upset with hoppa he is yeah. not making the point that he has issues with jews germans catholics homosexuals haitians families with or without children no, or smokers that, he's right. making the case that in a free society if this is how you want to restrict your property you are fully within your rights to do right. so. <laughs> right. That's an example of how someone might uh, put restrictions on their property. Yeah. Yes. Clearly, under this scenario, no such thing as freedom of immigration exists. Rather, many independent private property owners have the freedom to admit or exclude others from their own property in accordance with their own unrestricted or restricted property titles. Admission to some territories might be easy, while it might be nearly impossible to others. In any case, however, admission to the property of the admitting person does not imply a freedom to move around unless other property owners consent to such movement. 
Right. There will be as much immigration or non-immigration, inclusivity or inclusivity or exclusivity, desegregation or segregation, non-discrimination or discrimination based on racial, ethnic, linguistic, religious, cultural, or whatever gra- other grounds as individual owners or associations of individual owners allow. That's right. Also, yeah, yeah the Jews are not a lot on my property. Just, uh, <laughs> just, just putting that out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, most Jews a motherfucker i know <laughs> go on <laughs> he's uh yeah i mean i think he's kind of just um like reiterating reiterating that point again that you will have um yeah like all different forms of uh discrimination uh you know as far as what people are going to allow on their own property and then he brought up the point which i think is a one of the key points here is uh when you're talking about uh immigration here is that yeah, this is all what he's talking about here is an entirely privatized society where all land is owned by a private by private owners. Um, he's saying that on that private property, there is no such thing as like a freedom of movement for somebody who is not actually the owner of the property. Like they are allowed to move on that property by the owner. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, at some point, I believe uh as we go on in this chapter, he's going to then apply that idea to um like the public property. Yep. All right. On to you, Toad. All right. Note that none of this, not even the most exclusive form of segregationism, has anything to do with the rejection of free trade and the adoption of protectionism. From the fact that one does not want to associate with or live in the neighborhood of blacks, Turks, Catholics, or Hindus, etc., it does not follow that one does not want to trade with them from a distance. To the contrary, it is precisely the absolute voluntariness of human association and separation, the absence of any form of forced integration that makes peaceful relationships, free trade between culturally, racially, ethnically, or religiously distinct people possible. Yeah, so he's made that point in like previous chapters, uh, I think in like the decentralization one, as far as like if you decentralize and you kind of wind up with like people that have like a common culture kind of living together like they're still like they're going to be more incentivized actually to like trade with uh you know the other cultures and stuff because like well this country or this whatever over here like might be better at making this thing whatever and you're going to trade with them you know it's beneficial to you to do so and that actually has nothing to do with whether you want to actually like associate with these people on like a more consistent basis a more personal basis right like you know, I go out like to a store, a restaurant, whatever. I go to all these places all the time and I buy things for people. Like I'm not actually going to be living with every single one of those people as well. Mm-hmm. All righty. Uh, yeah, I don't so, really have much to add to that. I, I, The only point I thought, which I guess is, I don't really feel like it has too much to do with it, but this is where it gets into weird distinctions. A lot of times you'll see some of the uh white separatist types and i don't i'll to be clear i don't agree with any of these i think they're silly Uh, like i don't personally like i don't i wouldn't want that but this is where you get into arguments of nuance where it's like because people will always be like oh racism is bad and it's like okay yeah i guess maybe in a certain sense you don't have to like racist but like should we apply state force against them this is where you get into arguments about like voluntary ethno states or not even ethno state but ethno communities or whatever and if that's if we got into a free society type system and that is how people wanted to organize their lives, whatever, more power to them. But I mean, yeah. I think personally, I'm of the opinion that likely, I mean, yeah, maybe initially there would be, that would be the case, but over time it would likely get broken down more along cultural type, uh, right. uh, you know, uh, lines and it would right. be like race or, you know, maybe, maybe religious would probably stick around. Cause I think religious is more cultural than like a race per se. Cause yeah. I mean, just being black or something or, or, or Mexican doesn't necessarily mean you're going to only mm. want to interact with those people. And like, right. it, cause you know, a lot of those people interact like, you know, cause a lot of time when we think of like black, you think of uh, you immediately uh, inherently ha- apply stereotypes of like urban hip hop, whatever. And that's not really something that's explicitly something to do with their skin color. If anything, that's more of a cultural thing. That's why, you yeah. know, you, there are plenty of 
white people and uh, you know, Hispanic I was people say, that fall I, I, along those lines. I so. think of third world countries and starvation, actually. But <laughs> okay, but you you get my point. If anything, yeah. I'll be more along cultural than I think it would be about along racial. But you know, whatever. Maybe initially, or maybe there would be. Yeah, I don't know. For all I fucking know, I mean, we wouldn't know until this experiment is tried out. Maybe there would be some you know, racial colonies that, you know, stick around for forever and do really well. I don't fucking know, but I don't think Mm -hmm. so. I think it would likely break down more along cultural slash religious, which religion is to to some extent a cultural thing. So something like that, people get mad at me because I say that it's something that just happens right now. Anyway, like when you're in a city and you have a lot of uh, different uh, like cultures in that city or, you know, people from uh, different countries and stuff like that, they tend to still like, kind of be together, congregate together, live together. Like, you know, there's a Chinatown in like all these cities and a lot of uh, the Chinese and Asian uh, immigrants will live in that area, congregate in that area. I mean, they share a common culture, common language, common food, whatever. And then of course they still, of course, you know, they thrive in that area. They still trade with other people. Like I go there, I go to the restaurants, you know? Yeah. And my only point though, is like, say with Chinatown, like, yeah. yeah, don't get me wrong. The vast majority of people there are going to be Chinese, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's explicit to, you know, that their racial color or whatever, that there very well will probably be Chinese people that, you know, end up integrating in other cultural areas because they fit in yeah. more along those cultural lines than they do with the, right. the Chinese. They may have more in culture with, I don't know, you know, West Coast yuppies. I, I don't know. Or something. You know, I, I know that's the only example yeah. that came to mind, you know. But yeah. all right. Um, yeah. And then um, he just made the point that because uh, he's kind of talking about forced integration. And that is what this chapter kind of uh, is about uh, to a large extent uh, where he's he's going to say or he basically he kind of already has alluded to it, at least that uh, open borders are just letting everybody in is kind of going to create this like uh, culture clash. Like it's more likely to create conflict. Whereas if you let people decide for themselves and kind of self segregate in a way that leads to more peaceful relationships, which is also what he was talking about in like the yeah. uh, decentralization and secession. Chapter. Yeah. I'm a, I also am of the opinion this forced integration will actually cause things to more solidify along those lines, you know, whether it be racial or whatever as along to, as opposed to allowing more trickle over between, you know, different groups or, or whatever. Cause, uh, you know, I, I think it kind of, like you said, it creates conflict, which then creates people to entrench in their own positions. Uh, it's, right. this is why I tend to actually, you know, fall more in line in my opinion along Malcolm X as opposed to MLK. Cause that was one of big yeah. X's big points was that like, the forced integration that occurred in the civil rights movement, he was not a fan of. And I actually a hundred percent agree. Like the fact right. that you would force two cultures together, uh, if anything, that's just going to cause more cultural clashes oh, yeah. and cause people to dig in more into their respective, uh, whatever culture they have, as opposed to yeah. letting them, you know, exist in their own cultures. And then, you know, whichever one prospers more is more likely to, you know, uh, if anything, it might cause people from the one culture to, you know, be like, well, I don't know, maybe they have something better going on over there or, you know, so. Yeah. Like, like public school busing, for example, like that's yes. an example of, yeah, force integration. It was obviously a failure. And, you know, I think you can compare that to open borders and, you know, we'll mm-hmm. throw that, throw that out there for the, uh, the open borders, uh, libertarians there. Cause I think probably most of them are, are, in agreement with me that, uh, you know, the forced, uh, school segregation and the, the busing was a failure. Well, you know, let's apply that to open borders. <laughs> Explain to me why it's not, uh, you know, pretty much the same thing. All right. All right. Um, section four. four. Yeah. In an anarcho capitalist society, there is no government and accordingly no clear cut distinction between inlanders, domestic citizens and foreigners. This distinction only arises with the establishment of a government, i.e. an institution which possesses a territorial monopoly of aggression, taxation. The territory over which a government's taxing power extends becomes inland, and everyone residing outside of this territory becomes a foreigner. State borders and passports are an unnatural, coercive institution. Indeed, their existence and that of a domestic government implies a twofold distortion with respect to people's natural inclination to associate with others. 
First, inlanders cannot exclude the government, the tax man, from their own property and are subject to what one might call forced integration by government agents. Second, in order to be able to intrude on its subjects' private property so as to tax them, a government must invariably have control of existing roads, and it will employ its tax revenue to produce even more roads to gain even better access to all private property qua potential tax source. This overproduction of roads does not result merely in the innocent facilitation of interregional trade, a lowering of transaction costs, as starry-eyed economists would have us believe, but leads to forced domestic integration, artificial desegregation of separate localities. Yeah, I know yeah. much to add to that one. He laid it up pretty well. Uh, yeah, so I mean, he does uh, bring up the fact that um, taxation and just the existence of government is in itself also a form of forced integration because the government is forced integrating themselves with you, essentially, because... Uh, they basically are just allowing themselves to come onto your property and take your property via taxation. Yep. Um, yeah. And then, you know, them ho ass roads was the rest of that, uh, the rest of that paragraph there. Yeah, no, that was a very, a very much a libertarian argument that the very existence of roads is forced integration or, or state roads. per se. State roads. Yes. Um, right. right. Moreover, with the establishment of a government and state borders, immigration takes on an entirely new meaning. Immigration becomes immigration uh, by foreigners across state borders, and the decision as to whether or not a person should be admitted no longer rests with private property owners or associations of such owners, but with the government as the ultimate sovereign of all domestic residents and the ultimate super owner of all their properties. Now, if the government excludes a person while even one domestic resident wants to admit this very person onto his property, the result is forced exclusion, a phenomenon that does not exist under private property anarchism. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, if the government admits a person while there is not a single domestic resident who wants to have this person as property, the result is forced integration, also non-existent under private property anarchism. And here is the, pair, the, uh, the conundrum of borders at all when it comes to you know whether it's basically the very existence of the government uh, choosing who gets to do it causes simultaneously force exclusion and force integration so there is yeah. this is a no-win scenario so far as right. libertarian ish you know in a libertarian sense uh, so this right. is the crux of the whole issue right here so right. no matter what they do whether they're open borders, closed borders, they have some, you know, in, in between policy, no matter what, it's fucked. <laughs> so, right. Because there's so always going to be somebody who doesn't want these people here and vice versa versus always going to be people who do want these people here. It, mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. And right. Yeah. yeah. So if you go all the way to, um, yeah, the open borders uh, side of things, then then you're just go you're moving the needle all the way to all forced integration if you go all the other way with all closed borders which is also ridiculous and not letting anybody in then you're going all the way to forced exclusion so as long as you have government borders there is no libertarian solution yep part 5 it is time to enrich the analysis through the introduction of a few realistic empirical assumptions let us assume that the government is privately owned the ruler owns the entire country within state borders he owns part of the territory outright. His property title is unrestricted. And he is partial owner of the rest. As landlord or residual claimant of all of his citizen tenants, real estate holdings, albeit restricted by some pre-existing rental contracts. He can sell and bequeath his property and he can calculate and capture the monetary value of his capital. Traditional monarchies and kings are the closest historical examples of this form of government. Once again, he's doing the thing he's done throughout this book where he shows a problem and he shows why monarchy is he's going to get into why it's slightly preferable. Obviously, it still right. falls prey to the same exact issue, but he will explain here why it's a little bit better. Mm -hmm. What will a king's typical immigration and emigration policy be? Because he owns the entire country's capital value, he will tend to choose migration policies that preserve or enhance rather than diminish the value of his kingdom, assuming no more than his self-interest. So the point he's kind of getting at here is that it is closer to what most people would probably prefer because of right. the way a monarchy works and because 
he is going to want to, like you said, enrich the capital, the country's capital value. He essentially wants them yes. to do economically better. So generally speaking, he's probably going to pick an immigration or emigration policy that more closely aligns to what people would want in a true free society. Yeah. So like, for instance, he's probably going to want to uh, have people come into his country who are actually more productive yes. and will produce more wealth. Mm -hmm. As far as emmigration is concerned, a king would want to prevent the emigration of productive subjects. Oh, in particular, <laughs> yeah, in particular of his best and most productive subjects because losing them would lower the value of the kingdom. Thus, for example, from 1782 until 1824, a law prohibited the immigration emigration of skilled workmen from Britain. On the other hand, a king would want to expel his non-productive and destructive destructive subjects. Criminals, bums, beggars, gypsies, vagabonds, etc. <laughs> this, uh, this, this chapter is pretty funny. He, he gets pretty yeah. brutal in how he describes some people. Oh, for yeah. the removal from his territory, uh, for their removal from his territory would increase the value of his realm. For this reason, Britain expelled tens of thousands of common criminals to North America and Australia. Yeah. On the other hand, as far as immigration policy is concerned, a king would want to keep the mob. Uh, uh, as well as all people of inferior productive capabilities out. People of the latter category would only be admitted temporarily as seasonal workers without citizenship, and they would be barred from permanent property ownership. Thus, for example, after 1880, large numbers of Poles were hired as seasonal workers in Germany. A king would only permit the permanent immigration of superior or at least above average people, i.e. those whose residence in his kingdom would increase his own property value. Thus, for example, after 1865, with the re revocation of the Edict of Nancy... 1685. Oh, 1685. Yeah. Tens of thousands of Huguenots were permitted to settle in Prussia. And similarly, Peter the Great, Frederick the Great, and Maria Theresa later promoted the immigration and settlement of large numbers of Germans in Russia, Prussia, and the eastern provinces of Austria, Hungary. Right. Uh, in brief, while though his immigration policies... While through his immigration policies, a king might not entirely avoid all cases of forced exclusion or forced integration, such policies would by and large do the same as what private property owners would do if they could, uh, could decide whom to admit and whom to exclude. That is, the king would be highly selective and very much concerned about improving the quality of the res uh, resident human capital so as to drive property values up rather than down. Yeah. So as you said, like he's been doing uh, throughout the book, he is um, looking at monarchy and talking about how monarchy is closer to um, mimicking what would happen in a private property scenario than um, a democratic system of government would be, um, you know, because the king is actually more concerned with uh, yeah, maintaining the wealth of his kingdom. Uh, it's more of a privately owned kingdom and yeah he's going to uh that's going to reflect in yeah his immigration policies and who he lets in who he wants uh out uh and he, he kind of started to uh sort of uh, mention physical removal <laughs> in there as well so yeah somewhat all right all right uh yeah section six migration policies become predictably different once the government is publicly owned the ruler no longer owns the country's capital value, but only has current use of it. He cannot sell or bequeath his position as ruler. He is merely a temporary caretaker. Moreover, free entry into the position of a caretaker government exists. In principle, anyone can become the ruler of the country. So that's you know something that he's talked about yep. all throughout the book as well, um, where, yeah, when you have people that are not the permanent owner of the government or that property. And they're just, uh, yeah, temporarily in charge. They're going to have much higher time preference. And, um, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. I mean, I mean yeah. we can keep moving. Yeah. I mean, that is just restating a lot of the stuff you said throughout this. Yeah. Like they won't be, um, as incentivized to maintain uh, the wealth of it. And they're more incentivized to just use all of it right now. Mm. Um, all right. As they came into existence on a worldwide scale after world war one, democracies offer historical examples of public government. What are a democracy's migration policies? Once again, assuming no more than self-interest maximizing monetary and psychic income, mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was like, wait, what? Money and power. Democratic yeah. rulers tend to maximize current income, which they can appropriate privately at the expense of capital values, which they cannot appropriate privately. Uh, what? Yeah, that uh, that sentence read a little weird, but all right. It does read a little weird, yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. at the expense of capital value. Yeah, because they can't they can't right. appropriate the capital values, but they can do the current income. Correct. Yes. So. Yes. Uh, hence, in accordance with democracy's inherent egalitarianism of one man, one vote, they tend to pursue a distinctly egalitarian, non-discriminatory emigration and immigration policy. Yep. Which, of course, is what we're seeing, um, you know, in the U.S. and other Western countries like that. That is their tendencies going toward. Uh, yep. Yeah, this was a big thing. Trump got a lot of egalitarianism. This is a big thing. Trump got a lot of problems or a lot of shit for when he was a uh, he was really pushing the border issue. And I'm not saying I entirely Build agree with Trump. But, well, not that particularly. Yeah. <laughs> but he made there was a few times he made comments about like, well, I don't know, maybe we should permit people from. Uh, I don't know this country that tends to be more productive yeah. or these types right. of people that are more productive as opposed. And yeah. then everyone screams, Oh my God, racism. How would you, how dare yeah. you discriminate based on, uh, yeah, they got mad at, doctor yeah. or this or that. And it's like, well, okay, but that's, yeah. you want to bring better people in your country. It's not just, about, it's right. not just about bringing everyone, but right. yeah. they got mad at them. Yeah. For talking about like the Mexican gangs and like mm. they're bringing drugs, <laughs> they're yeah. bringing crime. And some of them I assume are also very fine people <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> all right um oh and they're rapists i forgot to throw yeah. that in there as far as emigration policy is concerned this implies that for a democratic ruler it makes little if any difference whether productive or unproductive people geniuses or bums leave the country they'll all have one equal vote in fact democratic rulers might well be more concerned about the loss of a bum than that of a productive genius while the loss of the latter would obviously lower the capital value of the country and loss of the former might actually increase it, a uh, democratic ruler does not own the country. In the short run, which in the short run, which is of the most interest to a democratic ruler, the bum voting most likely in favor of egalitarian measures might be more valuable than the productive genius who, as egalitarianism's prime victim, will more likely vote against the democratic ruler. Yeah. So in the democracy, yeah, as he's saying, where every single person has one vote, uh, everybody has that equal vote. Like the incentives actually line up uh, such that uh, the government is actually incentivized to um, want uh, the voters to be those people that are, that are going to vote to expand the government further, essentially and vote. Yeah. For more uh, egalitarian measures or, you know, vote, uh, yeah, for themselves to, uh, you know, get more, uh, like via the welfare state or something like that. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, that, um, other guy there, the productive genius is like, you know, the net taxpayer essentially, and is going to be more likely to, uh, not want to vote for higher taxes that he has to pay. Mm. Um, yeah, for the same reason, quite unlike a King, a democratic ruler undertakes little to, undertakes little to actively expel those people whose presence within the country constitutes a negative externality, human trash, which drives individual property values down. Yeah. I love that line. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Take out the trash, baby. Physically remove it. In fact, such negative externalities, unproductive parasites, bums, and criminals are likely to be his most reliable supporters. Yeah, which yeah, is so exactly like, the point you made before. Yeah, right. Again, yeah, it's the yeah the people that are going to uh, tend to want to vote for uh, that government official again are going to be those types of people. Yeah, low information voters are great for democracies. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, they want. To, yeah, the um, what whatever he said the. Uh, the idiotic bum or whatever, rather than the productive genius. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as immigration policies are concerned, the incentives and disincentives are likewise distorted and the results are equally perverse for a democratic ruler. It also matters little whether bums or geniuses below or above average civilized and productive people immigrate into the country. 
nor is he much concerned about the distinction between temporary workers, owners of work permits, and permanent property-owning immigrants, naturalized citizens. In fact, bums and unproductive people may well be preferred as residents and citizens because they create more so-called social problems, and Democratic rulers thrive on the existence of such problems. Moreover, bums and inferior people will likely support his egalitarian policies, whereas geniuses and superior people will not. The result of this policy of non-discrimination is forced integration. The forcing of the masses of inferior immigrants onto domestic property owners who, if the decision were left to them, would have sharply discriminated and chosen very different neighbors for themselves. Thus, as the best available example of democracy at work, the United States immigration laws of 1965 eliminated all previous quality concerns and the explicit preference for European immigrants, replacing them with a policy of almost complete non-discrimination multiculturalism. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, would, oh, yeah right. I would I would, emphasize the, the point. I actually underlined this. Uh, the result is policy of non-discrimination is forced integration. The result forcing a masses of inferior immigra- immigrants under domestic properties who decision were left to them would have sharply discriminated, chosen very different neighbors themselves. This is a, the whole point right. of forced integration, because under the current paradigm uh, of, you know, the way we go about, especially in democratic countries, uh, with it is they tend to like they are making the points they tend to bring the human trash is what they is more incentivized for yeah. to open the doors for them uh, and in a free society these are the kind of people you would not want to come over so uh, right. this is less in line with a free society than the 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 opposing option you know or or something that a, maybe a monarchy would go for or what have you. Yeah. And he did mention that also, uh, like they're going to want to like bring in those like bums and poor people more so because they can point at that as one of those like persistent problems that never goes away that like, Hey, we can fix this. Like, as the government has to justify yeah. their own existence. Homelessness, so that's, crime, you right. know, uh, you know, uh, we saw what the, I'm not saying this is necessarily it, but you, you see all these like cop brutality things which you know this is an increase of crime i'm not saying that safe with a tear or whatever the dude's name was uh thing i'm not i don't even know the situation there but tear i don't know if it's tear yeah. or tired but when tire, you have more tire, crime tire, you're gonna have nickels. more you're gonna have more of these negative uh type of uh, interactions with cops likely obviously this is also an issue due to the cops right. but you know it, right. it creates more social problems that brew up that allow them to be able to you know uh be like oh well we have to have a government solution here Yes. Yep. Indeed, the immigration policy of a democracy is a mirror image of its policy towards internal population movements, toward the voluntary association and dissociation, segregation and desegregation, and the physical distancing and approximating of various private property owners. Like a king, a democratic ruler promotes spatial over-integration by overproducing the public good of roads. However, for a democratic ruler, unlike a king, it will not be sufficient that everyone can move next door to anyone else on government roads. Concerned about his current income and power rather than capital values and constrained by egalitarian sentiments, a democratic ruler will tend to go even further through non-discrimination laws. And I I do like how he brings this into the the fold here is how even these kind of, in, in a sense, fall in line with this similar concept. One cannot discriminate against Germans, Jews, blacks, Catholics, Hindus, homosexuals, etc. The government will want to increase the physical access and entrance to everyone's property to everyone else. And this is where you end up with non-discrimination laws where you get Mm. some fucking uh, baker that is forced to make a cake for a tranny. And I don't personally, you know, depending on the tranny, I guess, but I don't necessarily have any issue with trannies or gays or what have you. But I also I I have an issue with someone being forced to provide a service for them. But this is what comes into play with the non-discrimination laws. I think people should be able to voluntarily interact as they want to. If, If someone doesn't want to provide service to black people, they shouldn't have to. And it doesn't mean I have any issue with black people. It means. Uh, if anything, you can make the case that, like, well, I don't know, if he is some butthole that doesn't like interacting with black people and right, you don't then, like that, wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't you like to right. know this guy's a piece of shit? <laughs> right, and why would you want to give him your money and, you know, why yeah. would you want, uh, you know, his product, which, you know, he might make it in an inferior way for you? Like, who knows? 
Yep. Thus, it is hardly surprising that the so-called civil rights legislation in the United States, which outlawed domestic dim uh, discrimination on the basis of color, race, national origin, religion, gender, age, sexual orientation, disability, etc., and which thereby actually mandated, mandated forced integration coincided with the adoption of a non-discriminatory immigration policy, i.e. mandated internal desegregation, forced integration. Right. So that's, yep. um, yeah, the issue that um, libertarians have with the, uh, the Civil Rights Act. Uh, so it was sort of meant to uh, kind of end, uh, you know, like the state uh, segregation. Uh, However, uh, they replaced it with state desegregation. So they replaced, uh, like basically a policy of, uh, of forced segregation with a policy of forced integration. Yep. And so they went from one extreme to the other when it's just like, right. or you could just like stop doing things <laughs> and that would solve yeah. everything. But exactly. Yeah. And then, yeah, the thing about roads, I mean, yeah, sure. Like if anybody, you know, is kind of questioning, like, like if they think that the government doesn't overproduce the good of roads, uh, they do. It's just that like, if you're in a city like me, you don't really like see that. Cause you kind of see like, wait, there's like not enough supply of roads here. And that's true. Like in the areas of cities, like you have just traffic all over the place and you actually don't have enough roads, but the government does overproduce roads because everywhere else, like outside of the cities and stuff, you have roads everywhere that just aren't being used and stuff. So, yep. Yeah. All right. So that seven. is still true. Yep. Part seven. And this is, yeah, the end of the chapter. Yep. The current situation in the United States and in Western Europe has nothing whatsoever to do with free immigration. It is forced integration, plain and simple. And forced integration is the predictable outcome of democratic one man, one vote rule. Abolishing force integration requires the de-democratization of society and ultimately the abolition of democracy. More specifically, the power to, to admit or exclude should be stripped from the hands of the central government and reassigned to the states, provinces, cities, towns, villages, residential districts, and ultimately to private property owners and their voluntary associations. The means to achieve this goal are decentralization and secession, both inherently undemocratic and anti-majoritarian. One would be well on the way toward a restoration of the freedom of association and exclusion as is implied in the idea and institution of private property and much of the social strife currently caused by forced integration would disappear if only towns and villages could and would do what they did as a matter of course until well into the 19th century in Europe and in the United States to post signs regarding entrance requirements to the town and once in town for entering specific pieces of property, no beggars, bums, or homeless, but also no Muslims, Hindus, Jews, Catholics, etc., to expel as trespassers those who do not fulfill these requirements and to solve the naturalization question somewhat along the Swiss model where local assemblies, not the central government, determine who can and who cannot become a Swiss citizen. So he's making the case of decentralization and the idea that if we break down, say we say if even with this 50 state model, like uh, say we didn't have this, uh, you know, current paradigm where the federal government has like civil rights or wh whatever or, you know, or control the border. Uh, it should be individual states should be allowed to allowed to dictate their border policies and individual states should also be able to dictate along the lines of, you know, like the uh, like civil rights type stuff. So if yeah. they're say Maine decided they don't want to admit any blacks, you know, I think it's stupid, but whatever yeah. you, you don't have to live in Maine as long as there's like you can like you should be able, I guess, go elsewhere. But like, I guess that yeah. comes in their border policy a little bit. But South Shore rise again. Yeah, I think you should be able to. That should be thing you should allow, be allowed to do, and it should be able to break it down further and further. Now, within each county, down to the city, and then ultimately oh, yeah. down to the individual. That's right, exactly. the that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, exactly. That is what he's yeah. saying there. And of course, yeah, any of that form of uh, you know decentralization like that, like your uh, main example there, like if you do have decentralization like that, like these states are going to have to like compete with each other. So if yeah. you do have states that, you know, have a policy like that, they're going to be competing with states that don't. Yeah. So yeah. And I don't think they are probably won't do so well. <laughs> exactly. 
Right. Yeah, because I mean, especially if you look at it from a cultural sensibility, I think in a modern sense, most people don't like that. If Maine decided they wanted to be a white ethno state, I think most people wouldn't like that. I think most people, would leave, a lot of people would leave the state. I think they would probably flounder as a state. I think people, would, they, there probably would be even voluntary movements to boycott the state and whatever, you know, like so that, this is the predictable outcome of their decision. And, you know, they suffer the price that suffer the cost for it, you know? Yeah. So yeah, the Swiss model. Yeah. I'm not entirely familiar with, but I know they're split into 32 cantons and, you know, they have various cantons, like a bunch of them are French speaking, a bunch of them are German speaking. I think some are Italian speaking. They kind of have their own cultures mm -hmm. and stuff. So I think, you know, they probably have a less intrusive federal government than many other countries do. Um, okay. What should one advocate as the relatively correct immigration policy? However, as long as the democratic central state is still in place and successfully arrogates the power to determine a uniform national immigration policy, the best one may hope for, even if it goes against the nature of a democracy and thus is not very likely to happen, is that the democratic rulers act as if they were the personal owners of the country and as if they had to decide who to include and who to exclude from their own personal property into their very own houses. This means following a policy of the strictest discrimination in favor of the human qualities of skill, character, and cultural compatibility. Yep. And I think he pointed out kind of sort of where I'm at with the border thing, because like this mm -hmm. is kind of what I think. And if we were to dictate somehow on a federal level how they should control their border policy, yeah, that should be how it be. It should be generally speaking what people would tend to prefer in a certain sense. They prefer, you know, you know, you bring over people who are actually contributing in some sense. But mm. I guess where I'm coming from is more that like what Hoppe is pointing out, it's kind of futile. Like the idea yeah. that you're going to get this democratic uh, thing to operate against his incentives is a little silly. Uh, but this mm. is why he doesn't really advocate. This is why uh, uh, Hoppe doesn't really advocate any sort of like pushing of federal anything. He's very much right. hyper localism. And this is why I tend to kind of agree with him because it's mm. like you're you're not going to make any headway in that way advocating i mean i guess in a certain sense verbally you can advocate it but really putting any sort of mass effort in that is just a you know kind of a fool's errand you like good luck <laughs> you know scott horton yeah. yeah um yeah i mean I, I mean i pretty much do agree with that like yeah as he's saying that uh, it would be against uh, the nature of the government to actually do that so they probably won't do that but i think that it still makes sense to advocate for them to do that anyway if uh, mm. we think that it is uh better and would result in in an improvement and my point just being uh, i'm not going to put a lot of effort into right. i know political movements for this this border policy or that border policy because it's right. like why would i really put any sort of my physical or mental energy into this thing that's not going to happen anyways so right but right. One. So, I mean, I do agree with him, though, that like if we are so I think probably most libertarians will uh, at least I think agree that privatizing everything is the ideal solution. Like maybe maybe some of them don't. I don't know. But uh, then, you know, the a lot of the arguments come, uh, you know, down to what he was just talking about there, where it's well within uh, this democratic system what would the more ideal solution be? And I think uh, the answer is clearly like some form of restriction uh, that kind of would like mimic what would happen in a private uh, scenario. Uh, even if we don't think that, you know, it's very likely that we can get there. I think that it makes sense to advocate for it at least. And I was going to point out that uh, this paragraph kind of made me think, uh, uh, you know, it's because I think it's hilarious. It kind of made me uh, think about uh, recently when DeSantis uh, sent some small number of immigrants up to Martha's Vineyard. Do you remember that? Yeah. Uh, it was like 50 immigrants or whatever. And he sent them up to the place where, you know, the elites and the politicians actually live. And they came up with all these excuses like why, well, we can't take them in basically, even though they constantly advocate for, we have to take them in like to this country or whatever. And you're a bigot and whatever, a horrible person, if you don't want to bring them in. And then, you know, when you, call their own bluff like well they're not going to take them into their own neighborhood or whatever so you know exposing their hypocrisy yep which you know he kind of uh, mentioned there as far as you know that into their very own houses comment <laughs> that's that's what made me think about it mm. 
uh, you right, know, well, so pushing ground. them towards like who, what types of people would they actually want? Yeah. In their own neighborhoods and houses. All right. Uh, more specifically, it means distinguishing strictly between citizens, naturalized immigrants and resident aliens. And Oh, real quick. I, yeah. I, I, I a paragraph, but that literally made me think of why also, uh, God, uh, fuck, um, like secession or like, uh, or, um, decentralization would be good because, you know, that is actually a prime example of it. Because if you do break it down by, if you did have states that had stricter border policies about like, Hey, we're only going to bring in these people or that people, then it causes these other states who always tend to advocate it, especially states who typically aren't border states. It's going to cause them to maybe be fall a little bit more in line with the common sense position because now they actually have something to lose because like the Martha Vineyards example, they will actually have to have some skin in the game and actually have to take in these people. But sorry, I didn't right. mean to cut you off. Go on. No, that's all right. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and resident aliens and excluding the latter from all welfare entitlements. Uh, it means requiring for resident alien status, as well as for citizenship, the personal sponsorship by a resident citizen and his assumption of liability for all property damage caused by the immigrant. It implies requiring an existing employment contract with a resident citizen. Moreover, for both categories, but especially that of citizenship, it implies that all immigrants must demonstrate through tests, not only English language proficiency, but all around superior, above average intellectual performance and character structure, as well as a compatible system of values with the predictable result of a systematic pro-European immigration bias. Yeah, that's the Walter Block argument, isn't it, for how we could do a proper uh, immigration system, I believe. He I might argue for that. Uh, I've always attributed it to Hoppe. I don't know who kind of like came up with it but i kind of always hear it as being like the hopian uh or hoppa um i don't sponsorship uh program but maybe you're maybe, right i thought that was i for some reason i thought that originated with block for some fucking it's reason. possible i don't know but yeah i mean once again that's kind of like what he's advocating what you should do i guess in a federal system or i guess even on a state level depending on like how you break it down but uh uh, right. I think so he probably make the case it's not very likely, <laughs> but I guess once yeah. you start breaking, once you start start decentralizing, it might be a little bit more uh, more uh, realistic, uh, you know, solve or fix while you're still in a uh, still in a um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Still in a fucking uh, you know uh, government system. Yeah, a democratic system, you know, yeah. whatever uh, the status paradigm. But yeah, yeah, he's basically saying that like kind of the ideal situation under that. Paradigm would be that you're uh, letting people in sort of under the sponsorship program and sort of the conditions are, well, they should have uh, some sort of uh, employment contract with an employer that is uh, vouching for them essentially. And then you kind of know that, okay, they're going to be a producer. Uh, and then uh, you also have like kind of that other uh, sponsorship requirement of uh, maybe it's the employer, maybe it's somebody else is going to kind of, uh, assume that liability so that way the incentives line up such that they're not going to want to bring in you know a criminal or something like that like they're saying like yes i vouch for this person like i think this person is going to be an upstanding uh person and you know member of this community or you know this country like whatever however you want to phrase it you know like the incentives would line up that way and like one of the things i pointed out recently because i see like people uh on the in the open borders camp kind of comparing it to comparing open borders to births and i don't think that's accurate and i said that births are more similar to the sponsorship program that hoppa is lining out here because in the case of a birth well first of all yeah i mean it is like what he just said here you have the parents if they're already citizens which we're assuming they are in this uh, case like they are already the sponsors of that new child, right? Like they are assuming the liability for that child. Like that child isn't a completely, you know, um, moral, uh, actor yet. Like, you know, uh, you know, an individual that, uh, uh, I don't know, like they don't, they haven't come into like all of their, uh, rights yet, essentially. Right. Like their rights are kind of held in limbo. So it's kind of like a similar situation there, uh, to a sponsorship. Yeah, that makes sense. All yeah. right, we're like now about halfway through the book, so uh, we're, we're twelve part twelve. So yeah. we'll be around like twenty five parts ish by by the time this thing's done. So uh, 
Uh, but yeah, now's a good time to go ahead and drop your plugs, bud, and we'll go ahead and get the hell out of here. Yeah, Tower Gang Toad. I'm not going to screw up like I did last week. The Tower Gang Podcast, uh, which is hosted by myself, Jose, Cole, a.k.a. Fat Dave, uh, Clint from Liberty Lockdown, Top Lobster, sometimes Reed Coverdale, and we are an insanely offensive comedy podcast run by a bunch of Liberty guys. And we are on every Wednesday night, 9, 11 PM tomorrow. We have one of the biggest guests that we've had uh, in the history of the show. I would say Sam Tripoli is coming on with us and we'll probably get into some conspiratorial stuff and do what we usually do and joke around quite a bit and be offensive. So 9, 11 PM and go check out the Patreon and support us. Patreon.com slash tower gang pod. Hell yeah. And uh, I do remind you guys, I'll be on TimCast February 8th. I'm not sure if this episode will drop before or after. Either way, go check it out. Go let them know uh, I did an awesome job, whether I did or not. I don't care. Uh, and yeah, I hope to see you all there. And uh, yeah, uh, if this is the No Way Jose show, you can find me on YouTube, all the major odd pockets. Obviously, as well, if you want to follow me on Twitter at Tower Gang Jose. Uh, yeah, patreon.com is No Way Jose 2020. If you want to support me, go get one of those. Uh, Terrence Yiki didn't kill himself shirts on toplobster.com. I believe it's on the fr- front page, and you can also find it in the uh, in the specifically the No Way Jose portion. So, and like, share, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. With that, we are out. Appreciate you hanging out again, bud. We'll do this again yeah. soon. Peace.